DJ environment. Where is, I can't see the picture. Oh, there he is, Professor Justin from the Greifswald Meyer Center, Sabine Wichmann also from the Greifswald Meyer Center and Kate Flood from Ireland, who's also working on Box and Pete's. Um, we will have this conference translated into German and French. You can just use the translate button, which should be at the lower end of your screen. At least that's where it is here. And um, I'm very honored to have so high level speakers online here. Thank you very much for making this possible. Um, we are really excited about what you might going to say about the diverse use of peatlands and what um, ecosystem services they might give to us and also on the importance for these of these ecosystems for our climate and biodiversity goals. We will start the conference with a video message from our Commissioner Virginia Sinkiewicz, who cannot be with us today due to other um, meetings he has to participate in, but he was so kind as to send us a video message in advance. And thank you very much also for our technical people in the background who make this possible. And please do start the video message from Virginia's. Ladies and gentlemen, Utah, honorable members, a very good morning to you all. And thank you for this invitation. I'm always surprised that we don't hear more about bogs. So I'm very pleased to see a conference on the topic. I know you understand their vital importance for biodiversity and climate, but many people are still unaware. When I speak about peatlands and carbon sequestration potential, some people find it hard to believe. So we need to do more to get that message out. And I'm delighted to see you so engaged with that. People need to understand the potential, but they need to understand the threats. Europe's bogs are not doing well, as we saw from the latest report on the state of nature in the EU. Large-scale extraction of peat for energy and horticulture, intensive agricultural use of carbon-rich soils have resulted in the loss of major part of their area over the last century. It's too late for some of them, but many losses can still be reversed. Over the last 25 years, the EU LIFE program has built up a wealth of restoration expertise. Some of these restorations have been quite large scale and measurable recoveries can already be seen. That's the case in the Belgian Ardennes, where six LIFE projects have helped with large-scale hydrological restoration. It's also true in Poland and Lithuania, where aquatic warblers have made a spectacular recovery thanks to targeted restoration and ecosystem management. And there are many more examples from the mires of Finland to Irish raised bogs. It's time to put that experience to good use and replicate it on a much larger scale. Member states have reported tens of thousands of square kilometers of degraded habitats that could be restored if resources were made available. Many of the funding needs have been quantified in prioritized action frameworks under the Habitats Directive. But very often, the political and financial support is still missing. I hope the Green Deal will change that. When we published the biodiversity strategy in May, we included ambitious targets for stronger nature protection and restoration. Bugs, fens and mires are singled out as priority targets for restoration and for inclusion as strictly protected areas. Ecosystems with the highest potential for storing carbon are also recognized in our proposals to develop legally binding EU nature restoration targets. We plan to put forward those new legally binding EU targets by 2021. And I count on the strongest possible support for those targets from the Parliament. But besides restoration targets, achieving the goals of the strategy requires the full implementation of EU legislation on birds, habitats and water. Member States endorse the strategy. 
That means they are committed to ensuring that protected habitats and species are no longer deteriorating by 2030 and that conservation trends for at least 30% of them are improving in the next 10 years. That's a movement we must all get behind. Let's make these 10 years the restoration decade, so that at the end we can look back and say, yes, we got nature back on track. As we emerge from the pandemic, we have a tremendous opportunity. We have unprecedented financial tools to jumpstart the economy and a chance to put sustainable investments at the heart of the recovery. Let's make sure that restoring peat box is part of that recovery, creating green jobs to help build a more resilient future. I hope this too will be on the agenda this morning. I wish you very fruitful discussions. I look forward to hear about the outcome of the debates and I assure you of my full support. Thank you. Well, that was really reassuring, and I'm especially glad to hear that the Commission will present legally binding restoration targets. Um, we will gladly work on this in European Parliament, and as Virginius has said, he will be gaining the input that we give today, and I'm really counting on this. I forgot something in my housekeeping rules. This webinar will be recorded, and of course, it can be watched again on the homepage of the Greens EFA and also on my own. So if anyone misses any part of this webinar, don't worry, you can watch it again. Um, I have now the great pleasure to introduce Carlos Romao from the European Environment Agency for his presentation. The European Environment Agency has launched the State of Nature report um, shortly ago. And reading this report, I was a bit, um, well, depressed on the deteriorating stage, especially of bogs and peatland and wetland, which are so important ecosystem, as I just said. And I'm now very excited to hear from Carlos what is the actual state and what should be done here. Please, Carlos, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I have to thank the invitation for the agency to present some of, of the results focusing on, on peatlands uh, from the last State of Nature uh, report. Um, just to recall that this is a regular report under the nature directives, the habitats and the birds directive, that member states provide information on a, a number of species and habitat types. Uh, and I've, I've made uh, um, uh, some analysis based on all this data, but focusing uh, specifically on the topic of this, um, of this conference. So in overall, I've selected 18 habitat types that are not just only uh, peatlands, but also wet heaths and some grasslands on peat soils, uh, also some bog woodland that I believe uh, go well into this uh, package. Uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, Mrs. Paulus just said she was a bit depressed reading the State of Nature report. It's true that uh, the results are not uh, very encouraging. And here we have a, an overview of the status of, uh, of this peatland uh, uh, habitats. And we can see that is uh, only a very tiny fraction that is in really in a, in a good status. Of course, this changes a little bit uh, the image uh, according to the different biogeographical regions in Europe. But overall, the, 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 the picture is quite negative. Uh, this is just an example of what the member states report. I just picked up here uh, active raised bogs, uh, where um, we can see the, the color of the status uh, on the biogeographical scale for each of the member states. And we have this information publicly available for every single habitat and species that the countries reported on. If you look also at the trends in the conservation status, uh, here the situation is also very worrying because we see that only a tiny fraction 
is really improving and the overwhelming uh, uh, majority of, uh, of these habitats are still are in a bad status and they are getting worse. Uh, again, in the different biogeographical regions, we have different uh, um, figures, but the trends are in general uh, quite negative. Uh, another information we got for the first time from the member states was about the condition of, uh, of the habitat types. And uh, we can see here the, the different percentages. Uh, overall, the condition is 45% good, but we have almost as much uh, unknown information for which the member states were not able to indicate if the condition was good or not good. Based on what was uh, reported as not good uh, condition, uh, we could estimate that uh, for these 18 peatland habitats that I've selected, uh, there would be uh, an absolute minimum to recreate or to create uh, the areas that have been lost of about 3,000 square kilometers and also uh, 22,000 square kilometers that would need to be improved. But again, this is a strict minimum, but because if we take into account the percentage of unknown, these figures can be much, much bigger. Mr. Just Mao, quick... could you yes. turn your whole screen big? We just, just see a small part of the PowerPoint. Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't hear your... We what just see, we see your whole screen and only a small part of the PowerPoint. If you could make the PowerPoint big, that would be perfect. Thank you. Oh. Uh... Presentation mode should be. It's in presentation mode, but maybe I've done something wrong with them. Um, in selecting, I will try to share it again. I'm very sorry for that. Um, can you see it now, full screen? Perfect, thank you. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Um, and I should get back few slides. I'm very sorry. So I was about to mention the pressures that were reported by the member states and this matrix just indicates the broad uh, categories of pressures for all the habitats uh, and species uh, for which the member states reported. Uh, and I will focusing specifically on this 18 habitat types. I've grouped this information uh, into different uh, categories. And we can see that uh, the management of these habitats, it's among one of the most frequent pressures reported, uh, followed by pollution from different sources. And for instance, from the, the reporting, we could see that almost half of the pressures related uh, uh, pollution pressures are coming from agriculture. Um, also, another very important group of pressures is about drainage and water abstraction, but also the conversion of land and changes in land use. Uh, and this is followed also with, um, with uh, the changes uh, that are made to uh, river systems in terms of dams, canalization, etc. So uh, I would like, just like to jump a little bit out of the state of nature uh, to see that, uh, for instance, already in 1995, the commission had made a communication on the wise use and conservation of wetlands that uh, indicated that in the 20th century, we had already lost about two thirds of wetlands uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and I, I think, this communication is still quite uh, uh, new in terms of the message. If we update the language uh, to the buzzwords that we use currently and not in the 90s. Uh, another aspect uh, I would like to, sorry, to show is um, uh, another parallel assessment that was done uh, by the Joint Research Center with the support of the agency 
uh, under this mapping and assessment of ecosystems and their services, where the conclusions for wetlands are also in line with what we have in the state of nature and in, in other assessments. And one of the things that I, I would highlight here is that the intensive manage of many wetlands is making them as net emitters of carbon and not as uh, sinks as they could uh, function in. Um, another uh, report we have published uh, last year about floodplains. I also find it very relevant for the discussion of, on this topic. And this looked to a, a wider number of habitat types uh, that are linked to floodplains, where we can also see that these habitats are generally in a, in a very poor and bad condition. Uh, and finally, I would show some, just some results from the looking at the Corinland cover data for pit box one of the classes in the Corinland cover, where in the last 12 years, we had lost about uh, a net loss, uh, about 445 square kilometers, largely of this being uh, in, in Ireland. Although this is only 1% of the existing wetlands, if we had this to what, to the, all the losses we had in, in the last century, uh, the image is not very uh, reassuring. So I think this would be my final uh, slide. Uh, for those who will have access to the presentation, there are links to some of the uh, uh, data and assessments we have at the, uh, in the agency. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. That was a lot of information in just um, very limited time. And I invite everyone to have a closer look at the State of Nature report, which is, of course, publicly available. And you will find even more data in this report. And um, what I also forgot in the housekeeping rules, of course, you can pose questions through the question and answer tool on Zoom. You can also um, send questions through the chat if you don't uh, have access to the question and answer tool. We have now a few minutes actually for question and answers. And one was written as question, um, which I might just read now by Tom. The commissioner refers to peatlands under the habitats directive only. This excludes 90% of the peatlands in the EU. Shouldn't we make him aware that restoration is required in all degraded peatlands, no matter if they represent a habitat type of Annex 1 or not? Maybe you could say something to that question, Carlos. I would be very grateful. Yeah, um, I would not recognize that uh, the Habitats Directive or the, the pit box covered by the uh, Habitats Directive uh, only represent 10% of the pit box in Europe. I'm, the information we have is the contrary. I think the majority of peatlands are covered by the habitat types in the directive. Uh, maybe that could make a reference to the Annex 1 habitat types that are included in the Natura 2000 network. And there, the percentages may be lower, uh, but the, let's say the obligations of the Habitats Directive go beyond the Natura 2000 uh, network in terms of uh, the conservation of these habitat types. But it is, it is of course true that we should make sure that we are addressing not only the Natura 2000 network, but that we are looking at all um, habitats or deteriorated habitats that could be restored within the nature restoration plan in order to really make a difference here. And uh, we will hear further on in this conference what kind of um, sustainable use could also be made. So uh, um, protecting this habitat does not necessarily mean that um, humans have to stay out for eternity, but it is possible to sustainably use these habitats and also bring the advantages to people um, while not destroying them. That's, that's basically what we need to do. 
Um, I do not see any further questions now. And as we are already behind time, I would like to pass on the floor to Umberto Delgado from DG Environment, who is in charge actually of um, nature net restoration. Is that true, Umberto? Please go ahead. Yes, Jutta, I hope you listen to me well. But first, uh, a big thank you for this invitation, the chance to to speak uh, with you of this important topic of bringing bogs back. And indeed, yes, the biodiversity strategy and the unit nature restoration plan is in my remit. So, but let me then start and sharing some, some views and ideas with you. And the first part is that wetlands in general, peatlands, mires, fens, they are for long vital ecosystems of Europe's natural heritage. So they are for long a priority for conservation action and that's why we see in the habitat directive which covers a vast diversity of ecosystems but it does require member states to protect manage and restore the wetlands of european concern which includes different bogs fen and mire habitats and uh, in terms of what was said uh, yes natura 2000 is let's say a sample of areas of particularly a high value that was designated as sites and the objective of Natura 2000 is to ensure that these samples are indeed maintained, restored, and brought to a favorable conservator status, helping the recovery of the habitats throughout their natural range. And uh, uh, let's say we do have a huge Natura 2000 network with uh, over 27,000 sites covering more than 18% of EU land. So let's say the terrestrial designation is largely complete. So one could say, well, then things should be uh, very nice and well protected, shouldn't they? But as just pointed out by Carlos Roumont, despite action taken so far, and there is action taken, the overall situation is far from good. Huh? We, we have seen on the State of Nature report that came in October, revealing what you heard from Carlos, that the conservation status of most peat, mire, fen, uh, habitats remains unfavorable and actually it's almost one third of them that have actually continued to deteriorate in recent years. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is effective management. That's the challenge. Uh, it's not only designating the 2000 uh, sites, is to pass them into effective management and bringing in the restoration initiatives that can deliver the conservation objectives. And I think, honestly, we are in a new context helping to go in this direction. I'll say a bit more about that. But let me say, the, the key point indeed is that this goal of restoring um, wetlands is not about only protecting our natural heritage. Indeed, we know now that well-functioning wetland ecosystems, they provide a wealth of essential functions and ecosystem services that we need, of which some examples is well, they can actually reduce the risk of floods, they help regulate the local climate, they can contribute to water quality and quantity, but they are even, in the case of peatlands, a valuable record of the past, be it uh, sources of ancient climate history or even depositories of archaeological artifacts. And very relevant and more and more recognized is the key role of peatlands as carbon sinks. And the numbers are staggering because Peatlands in the world cover around 3% of the global land surface, but they store more than 450 gigatons of carbon. And to have, a, to have a comparison, this is greater than the amount of carbon stored in all the world's forests, which covers some 30% of the land surface. So this capacity to be carbon sinks is fundamental and more and more needed in the world of today due to climate change. Now, when we damage or drain peatlands, uh, it results in the desiccated peat that keeps oxidizing for decades and centuries. So it's rather important to conserve and restore and improve the organic soils and peatlands as a way to keep capturing uh, and storing uh, CO2. So I think peatlands are actually one excellent habitat to show the close link between climate and biodiversity objectives and the need to upscale the restoration of peatlands. Now, um, we know from long established historical pressures on uh, Europe's peat bogs, our commission also referred to the degradation of several 
but including the large scale extraction of peat for energy or for horticultural purposes and the intensive agricultural use of carbon rich soils. And this has indeed resulted in the loss of an enormous part of their area, especially in the last century. And as a uh, commissioner also said, part of these losses are irreversible or at least irreversible in any useful time scale of individual uh, human lives. But there's a lot of great opportunities to undertake major peatland restorations across the EU and then tapping for climate and biodiversity objectives. Uh, we, and we have expertise, even a lot of expertise on this over the past 25 years. The LIFE program, as also signaled by Commissioner Singevicius, has actually brought many projects of restoration covering substantial areas and often delivering in a rather short time periods measurable recovery, so actual results. That's where I think the new EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 provides a new playground, a new policy framework to really kick in investments and activity for restoration and protection of peatlands. First, the whole Green Deal, but especially the, the biodiversity strategy, it puts this emphasis on the link climate and, and biodiversity. And you find in the biodiversity strategy, this emphasis on restoring ecosystems with the most potential for climate, capturing and storing carbon and preventing the impact of natural disasters. This is a general um, stage. But then if you look into the biodiversity strategy, what does it contain? Well, for instance, we will come up with a new soil strategy to protect soil fertility, reduce erosion, increase soil organic matter, and promoting sustainable soil, soil management practices and restoring degraded soils. So one first element of restoration from the soil perspective. Then we have this EU nature restoration plan in, enshrined in the biodiversity strategy, calling for member states to ensure the no deterioration in conservation uh, trends and status of all habitats and species by 2030, and ensuring that at least 30% of species and habitats not currently in favorable uh, status should at least show a strong positive trend by 2030. I would say uh, peatlands, wetlands are very good candidates uh, for this. Then the biodiversity strategy asks for more space for nature with this trans-European nature network um, embrace, embracing Natura 2000 and nationally protected areas going to up to 30% of EU land and sea. And this is the most important point, effectively managed and restored, not just paper parks. So I think, uh, again, the member states will need not only to complete designation in Natura 2000 when needed, but especially to establish the conservation measures and based on them having clearly defined conservation objectives. And we will, and we are stepping up also enforcement action to ensure that these critical objectives uh, uh, will be coming in. Now, maybe the most important point is the strategy, as already referred, establishes the goal of setting binding EU nature restoration targets under a legislative proposal that we aim to bring in 2021, as the commissioner said. Well, one thing this nature restoration goals will definitely address is the habitats that have the most potential for climate purposes, be it mitigation, be it adaptation. So I cannot anticipate what will be the proposal or its impact assessment, but I, I'm sure that will certainly cover peatland and wetlands uh, because they do give a lot of co-benefits for climate mitigation and biodiversity as, as spoken, but also, and this is an important point that I, I believe will also be addressed in this conference, this restoration of peatland can also provide significant employment and other socioeconomic opportunities happening often in poorer peripheral regions of the EU. So it also helps to the just transition objectives uh, of, the, of the Green Deal. There's an example I like a lot from Ireland, which is this recent announcement by the Irish government that it will invest 108 million euros to restore over 32,000 hectares of bog 
and the objective is, of course, reducing carbon emissions in the coming decades, bringing uh, biodiversity benefits, but also generating some 400 jobs in the Irish Midlands. So I hope this kind of example can show up uh, in other areas uh, of the EU. Uh, um, as recognized also in the State of Nature report uh, in the EU, in EU assessment, we have literally tens of thousands of square kilometers of degraded forest of peat habitat area that could be restored rather quickly if the necessary resources would be available. So again, and the biodiversity strategy also refers to it, sufficient public financing, both the EU level and national level will be rather critical. And the member states are right now finalizing the planning of their needs for restoration through what we call the prioritized action frameworks where the funding needs and priorities for investment, both in Natura 2000 and related green infrastructure will kick in. So we are looking into these planning tools from the member states in order to ensure appropriate coordination and support from different EU funding, funding sources. So please keep attentive because in the coming weeks, we expect to have public consultations launched on the legal proposal to send binding nature restoration targets, as well on the new soil strategy and the upcoming new forest strategy. They all have close links. So I do invite all citizens in your constituencies to respond to them, to provide feedback so that we can uh, be able to take them uh, into account. And finally, I do think the Green Deal really provides an unprecedented opportunity to take the necessary action to respond to these combined challenges of climate and biodiversity, more so than ever before we have the recognition of how important Europe's peatlands are for nature, climate and people. So we will be very keen to work with the parliament, member states, stakeholders towards all this and uh, glad to engage in further discussions. Thank you very much and back to you. Thank you, Umberto, for these insights in commission work on, on this issue. I have a very specific question myself, um, which is addressed to funding, because um, a lot of the habitats which we need to restore are in member states where there is not so much funding available for nature protection, nature restoration. I'm very glad that um, during the budget negotiations, it was um, I might say so a green success to secure the biodiversity um, ring fencing of parts of the budget. And I sincerely hope that the live programs for bog and peat restora peatland restoration will be um, ramped up in order to be able to actually meet our restoration targets. What is your view on this? How much support do member states need to actually be able to fund these activities? Well, first, you referred to LIFE. LIFE is a very fundamental program. It will certainly uh, remain available for projects of restoration, including a peatland, but it will also remain a rather small program in the sense it's a kind of a demonstration program bringing in the projects and activities that can be upscaled through bigger funding opportunities. So in the current context, I see as a very positive the developments uh, around the MFF on the, mm, the not only the climate target that was already there and has been beefed up, but also the uh, having a biodiversity target also helps. And this, you know, target setting usually makes humans move. And I do think to begin with, if you think uh, if you um, uh, think about peatland restoration, bog restoration, that can go under climate finance. They can uh, as well go as biodiversity finance, it serves both. So the opportunities are there. And I, uh, I look very much forward on to the current discussions on the big funds, on the common agriculture policy, on the cohesion funding, on the, the recovery and resilience facility. All of them can and should also contribute to this overall climate and biodiversity goals that do deliver for economic and socioeconomic and socio, uh, social objectives also. So I think the, the, the potential is there. Now we need to also with the parliament and the council steer all this into the right direction, I hope. 
Yes, thank you very much. And there is actually a question um, which was um, sent in written form. I see the, those two raised hands. I will bring you in shortly. The question from Wolfgang is, regarding the importance of carbon dioxide storage in bogs and peatlands, there is a lot of money necessary to restore degraded wetlands. Where does it come from? Well, we heard a bit of that. And how does it go to the local authorities or NGOs? The money is there, proof the huge amount of money made available during Corona crisis. So um, basically the question is, which partners will be um, addressed um, when it comes to restoration? Well, I cannot indeed identify all, all uh, players because there's no exclusion of uh, a business can come in, a local authority, an NGO, uh, a university. There are many uh, uh, potential players that can do restoration in practice. How they get to the funding that this is, um, as usual in the EU funds, there's the shared management, for instance, to give the good example of the, of the common agriculture policy, it will depend a lot on the CAP strategic plans that each member state develops, that we uh, check, collaborate with the member states towards having them aligned with the EU objectives. And then through that support and the rural development, the eco schemes and so forth, all this can go to the players that actually manage the land. So I cannot identify here from the top of the iceberg <laughs> in Brussels, what will happen in the end is there's a very crucial role of member states and regional authorities, but I see no reason whatsoever how, uh, for this kind of project not hitting the ground as they should. Thank you. And I will now give the floor to Lijan. I hope I have pronounced it correctly, who has been raising the hand for so long. Um, I just gave you permission to speak, you might have to unmute yourself. Hmm. I don't see him or her anymore. So I will go on to Pavel. Pavel, you might have to unmute yourself. Something does not seem to work here. Maybe it works with Pietro. Mute. Pietro. Hello, Jutta. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Pietro. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I thank you because uh, this is a uh, very important event because I'm, I'm, I'm strongly in uh, support of the wetlands. Uh, I've been part of the same process that we had in uh, the US uh banning lead but also increasing the uh hectares of wetlands so as a way to increase the population of the migratory birds and this is fundamental because there is a, a lot of scientific studies that shows that uh, if you increase uh, the environment for the migratory birds uh, the population will increase and this is, I think, is the goal of all the environmentalists, as I uh, think of myself. I'm a hunter, but of course, I'm also an environmentalist. And I can show data from the U.S. that, uh, you know, all the migratory birds species has increased. Uh, one of the things that I need to ask to uh, Delgado is, uh, is the European data comprehensive and updated regarding migratory species, because uh, this is, I think, is a very good indication 
of uh, what we do about restoring wetlands. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about you know peatlands because for me in Italy peatlands doesn't have any meaning because we don't have them. But <laughs> it's mostly a Northern European uh, uh, phenomena. But so this is extremely important for me to understand uh, how do we move to increase the wetlands so that we can increase the population of migratory birds. And uh, of course, I'm against of the mantra of no activity or no humans in any area. Pietro, in my opinion, Pietro could, you, could it a bit short because we will be running behind schedule. Okay. Sorry, very fast. I'll, I'll close in 30 seconds. But uh, uh, the matter of no human activity or anything in the parks is wrong. Because in my opinion, we should uh, manage the park uh, in the correct way in uh, order to uh, do the right thing for biodiversity. So this is it. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all the speakers. Thank you, Pietro. And Umberto, you might just want to react to that. I do, I do. I thank very much for the comments. Let me try to be brief. Uh, first, indeed, when we restore wetlands, we get many services. And one of the services is nature itself. We get more birds. So, of course, for hunters, that's a plus. If we do preserve nature, we can benefit from several data. Uh, Carlos Roumain can probably confirm better than I on the EU data, but yes, we have a lot of data, including on migratory birds, on the species that are faring well, on those that are declining, and we are conducting all our action also in terms of that reference. But let me just uh, refer to, I, I've seen one of the questions actually asks, can we create a new a wetland? And the answer is yes, we can. Rewetting, especially where there was previous in the past a wetland that was purely destroyed, we can put it back. Of course, the amount of time required to get all the nice nature can be longer or not, but nature is generous and it delivers. So rewetting wetlands delivers a lot. My final comment would be, I think there's a bit sometimes of misconceptions when we speak of strict protection. When we speak of strict protection is for those habitats or nature that require a non-interventionist approach, or especially a non-extractivist approach. Does not mean don't go, don't touch. But my main point for Pietro is, this is purely human activity. If we decide as humans, we need strict protection, all that's required to ensure the strict protection is a management activity, taking out invasive alien species, ensuring proper visitation and so forth, and ensuring there's no interference with the natural um, um, way of the ecosystems, it's important. So I'm not an exclusivist at all of putting humans aside. The more we can benefit humans, the better. But in some cases, human benefit is also strict protection. Thank you. Yes, and one very last question, because we are, as I said, running behind time. Why is peat extraction and use not prohibited? Well, that's a good question for which I don't have a very clear reply. You know, peat extraction is a very ancient activity. And in some cases, it was in some places in Europe, almost the only adequate source people could have for energy. Now, of course, the values that society attributes to ecosystems and what they contain change. And we see more and more climate and biodiversity as values on the rise, be it referring to wetlands and peatlands, be it referring to forests. So I just gave you the example of Ireland that, that I've heard where there was extraction. And now it's also, as, as it's, it's my understanding that the company that in the past was extracting is being converted also into a, a peatland restorer, including uh, the, the workers. So we need to give room for this evolution of society, but more and more I would agree that peatland extraction doesn't make much sense. Okay, thank you Umberto. And um, I would really like to give the floor to Professor Joosten now, although there are 
still many questions, but um, maybe we can we can raise those in the discussion part or we can answer them after the webinar ha has concluded. But it would be a pity if Professor Justin did not have the opportunity to do his very extensive presentation and share his knowledge with us. Please, Professor Justin, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to share. I hope that it works. Let me see. Can you confirm that you see me? Great, thanks. Yes. So bring back box. I want to talk about the great rewetting of all peatlands. We have addressed a lot of questions already about biodiversity, about climate, about water quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I want to bring them into one framework. And the most important framework of our time is, of course, climate. We all know that our planet is getting warmer and warmer with decreasing food and water security and growing social breakdown and immigration. The frequency and severity of disasters are rapidly increasing with enormous losses of lives and money. And it are these developments that all countries of the world have unanimously have agreed have to stop. Actually, the Paris Agreement has made the world simple, I think. Since the Paris Agreement, we have one common goal to keep climate change well below two degrees with 1.5 degrees as more aspirational. And the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has spelled out what it means in its 1.5 report of 2018. It means for greenhouse gases that CO2 emissions have to be net zero in 2050 and have to be a net sink after 2050, that methane has to be reduced with 50%, and the emission of nitrous oxide with 20%. The implication of that is that we have to break radically with wrong developments from the past. Also, and there are we talking about with respect to peatlands. To get back in your memory, living peatlands that we also call Myers are ecosystems in which the production of biomass is larger than the decay. And as a result of that, the dead plant material accumulates as peat. Peat accumulates actually only through water saturation. Peatlands are always wetlands, at least living peatlands. Peat accumulates over thousands of years and has stored in this way concentrated carbon in thick layers. Actually, 55% of all the material in peatlands is carbon. And this has made peatlands to the most space effective carbon stores of all terrestrial ecosystems. There is no ecosystem in the world except for peatland that has so much carbon per hectare. The average peatland in the world uh, whether you include the tundra with very shallow peatlands or the tropical peatlands that are very thick, the average peatland in the world contains the same amount of carbon than 2 million liters of diesel. Or to make another comparison, a 15 centimeters thick layer of peat, which is not sufficient uh, to make this area into a uh, to an official peatland according to normal definitions, a 15 centimeter thick layer of peat contains per hectare already more carbon than a high carbon stocked tropical rainforest. That is the important density of carbon in peat. Peat is stored because of water saturation. And in this respect, it is like herring or gherkins. When you remove the conserving water, you can try it at home. After a while, the organic matter has rotten away. And we know exactly nowadays how this relationship is. The deeper the water table is, the more the greenhouse gas emissions are. For Central Europe, there is a very simple rule of thumb. Every 10 centimeters deeper average water level leads to five tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per hectare more. The rule 10 is five, easily to remember. To give you an example, 
deeply dra drained grassland on peat in Germany emits 29 tons of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. Again, an amount that is unimaginable, but you can compare it. This is the same amount of CO2 as a middle-class car emits when it drives 145,000 kilometers, every hectare, every year. The consequence is that the footprint of the products that the cows produce is immense. One kilogram of Gouda cheese, for example, contains more than five, 50 kilograms of CO2. One liter of milk contains more CO2 than two liters of petrol. I regret that very much. I like milk, but since I know that, I have reduced my milk drinking substantially. A potato field on peat in Europe emits 37 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. That means it loses twice more carbon than the produced potatoes contain. So peat potatoes are fossil resources like coal and oil. Oil palm is always in discussion, is important. Oil palm on peat emits 60 tons CO2 per hectare per year. That is equivalent to flying 50 times from Berlin to Jakarta, vice versa, economy class. So these emissions from drained peatlands are enormous. Globally, drained peatlands emit something like two gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year. That means that 0.4% of the land produces 5% of all global emissions. And in some years it is more because of peatland fires. Everybody knows that Indonesia leads the list of global top emitters from draining peatlands. But what is not so well aware and often forgotten, the European Union is a good second. Worldwide, agriculture is the main cause of peatland drainage and degradation and emissions. 80% of all emissions from drain peatlands come from agricultural peatlands. In Germany, eh, this picture shows it, it is very clear. In the inner circle, we have the area of agricultural land. Only 7% of that consists of organic soils of peat soils. But these 7% of peat soils are responsible for 37% of all agricultural emissions, including the methane from the, the, the cows, including the nitrous oxides from fertilizer, a disproportional importance. And actually in the European Union, it is the same. 3% of all agricultural land on peatland is responsible for 25% of all emissions from agriculture. And you see here, it's split it out for the various countries of the EU. The cross is of course, the United Kingdom, we skipped it out. You can monitorize these things like we have done with official German governmental data. In Germany, peatland agriculture causes annually a climate damage of 7.4 billion euros. And interestingly, uh, this agriculture gets at the same time more than 400 million euros of e European Union subsidies in the, in the, in, in the shape of uh, direct payments. The 7.4 billion euros of damage is equal to the total net value added of total German agriculture. This is only one problem that is associated with peatland drainage and peatland degradation. Another one that is not well known is that drainage leads to subsidence. The peat that is lost leads to a loss of height. And that is in our areas one to two centimeters annually. In Bavaria, they have measured it, three meters loss since 1836. In the UK, this poll, four meters loss since 1870. I myself come from the Netherlands where we have drained peatlands for a thousand years and we have bogged down the land because of peatland drainage and subsidence. We have the areas around The Hague and Amsterdam, they have this, uh, subsided more than eight meters. That's how you change a country from a country above sea level to a country below sea level. And the damage associated with drain, appeal to drainage by the subsidence is immense. The Netherlands has 300 million euros of annual damage to infrastructure and sewage systems because everything sags down. 
And it is recently estimated that until 2050, there will be 80 billion euros damage to houses as a result of peatland drainage. So to say it simply, whereas the sea level is rising because of climate change, we bog the peatlands down. Peatland subsidence, we have calculated, will in this century lead to uncontrolled flooding of 10 to 20 million hectares of productive land worldwide. So we are losing land now that we need it most. For more people, we will not stop population growth until after 2050. For less poverty, there are too many, too poor people, and to replace all fossil resources as we have decided in the Paris Agreement. Another issue, and that is the linkage to the Water Framework Directive. Peat oxidation in the European Union also causes, by uh, mobilization of the nitrogen in the peat, an annual emission of some 3 million tons of nitrate to ground and surface waters. This is equivalent to the excretion of 150 million people. Rewetting of peatlands solves most of these problems and provides additional ecosystem services. Wet peatlands are cool. They cool the landscape because more energy is needed for evaporation and less is available for heat. And that is important for climate change adaptation. Wet peatlands remove nitrogen by denitrification and they purify it and protect waters. What is important for our seas, uh, to uh, the, the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, all have too much nitrate getting in. Peatlands absorb high water events and reduce peak flow, which is important to adapt against climate change, which will uh, be associated with much more differences in uh, water supply and evaporation. And rewetting increases the regional groundwater availability, which is important to adapt to the increasingly dry periods that we are experiencing. And last but not least, Rewetting creates new opportunities for nature. The Paris Agreement implies for the world that we must rewet 500,000 square kilometers of drained peatland until 2050. For the European Union, mean, this means that until 2050, we have to rewet 5,000 square kilometers of drained peatlands every year. And many people call this illusorious or naive. Now, then the simple answer is, if you cannot do it, or if you do not want to do it, you cannot comply with the Paris Agreement and you have to become like Trump. And is this so impossible to regret so much? Finland drained in the 1970s 3,000 square kilometers every year. We have to do the opposite. And the best example at the moment is Indonesia. Indonesia in 2015 suffered peat fires over 20,000 square kilometers, 2 million hectares, which killed 100,000 people, brought half a million people in the hospital and created 20 to 40 billion US dollars domestic damage. And then the president has decided this has to stop. And since that time, in the period 2017, 2019, Indonesia has rewetted 8,000 square kilometers of peatland, 800,000 hectares. That is four times more as entire Europe in its entire history. We in Europe live in the best time in history on the best place on earth. If we cannot manage this challenge, who can? We have to turn back the meliorations as they are called from the past, the draining of peatlands with similarly large efforts. Until now, rewetting in Europe has focused on the easy stuff, on abandoned and low productive land with few emissions. But we have to go to the core of the problem. We have to go to intensive agriculture and forestry on drained peat. But of course, we cannot flood all drained peatlands worldwide and in Europe and take them out of production. It would bring very much for nature conservation. But these peatlands have been drained primarily to produce biomass. And at least a large part of that will need to be producing biomass. So we can solve these drainage problems only while maintaining production. And this is with paludiculture, wet agriculture and forestry, where Sabine is going to talk about later. The simple message is this, peatlands must be wet for the climate, for the land, for the people forever. Thank you.
I don't hear you. <laughs> yes, I, I have to unmute myself. Thank you very much. That was very, very impressive. And I think um, that was already the answer of one of the questions which had been um, written. How can we educate people on the importance of peatlands? I think just this kind of presentation with these very, very clear comparisons, what does it mean to grow potatoes on peatland? What does it mean to raise cattle on peatland? What does it mean to re-wet peatland or restore peatland in, in terms of um, CO2 emissions? Um, I have a very specific question which was written at the beginning of this webinar and where I thought that's something for Professor Yosten to answer. And Stefan wanted to know, um, can methane production while rewetting be mitigated in some way or is it inevitable that we have raised methane emissions when um, a bog or a peatland is rewetted? Yeah, the, the, the production of methane is the consequence of the absence of oxygen. And the absence of oxygen is the reason that peatlands, uh, that peat is uh, sequestered and peatland and peat is conserved. So if you want to conserve peatlands, you will always have methane. But, and that is of course the trick of rewetting, the emissions of CO2 from drained peatlands are so much higher than the emissions of methane after rewetting these peatlands, that the rewetting is almost every, all, always good. Yeah. We have some exceptions when you, for example, uh, flood a, a, a field of potatoes, then you create actually something like a biogas generator. Uh, so, of course, uh, you have to remove uh, such stuff before you rewet. But, and that is also important to recognize, and uh, we have to choose between CO2 and methane. CO2 is a weak greenhouse gas, but it is persistent and it accumulates in the atmosphere. Whereas methane is a strong greenhouse gas, but it is ephemeral. It only has a lifetime in the atmosphere of 12 years. So already after some tens of years, uh, the concentration of methane reaches a, a steady state, as we call it, a, 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 a color. It cannot go higher anymore. And that means that if we rewet, uh, always it will be beneficial uh, for the climate, maybe not in the first year, but already after a few years. We have modeled that extensively uh, on a national scales, on, on a world scale. We have published that this year also in Nature Communication, so on a high level. And it is very clear uh, we have to make peatlands wet and we have to do it as fast as possible. The longer we postpone, the longer the drained peatlands emit CO2 to the atmosphere and accumulate that. And we cannot get it out anymore. And the methane that we get after rewetting will be gone automatically after a few years. So that is the thing. We have to go for the methane and to fight the CO2. Yes, I mean, methane in, in German is also called Sumpfgas, so bog gas, and yeah, it, I'm, this I'm, is I'm, for I'm, a reason. <laughs> we do have some techniques also to reduce these methane emissions. Uh, there has been a lot of research going down, uh, out. Uh, the methane is generated from very fresh plant material, uh, from living, not from the peat, from the living plant. So if you remove the living plant, the up, above ground biomass before you rewet, and even if you remove the below ground biomass, if you, for example, do topsoil removal, five centimeters, you reduce your methane emissions already with 80%. Wow. And you can use these topsoils for filling up your ditches because you anyhow have to block your ditches. So uh, uh, there are other things. We have found out, for example, that uh, coastal peatlands, if you flood them a little bit, with, 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 with seawater, the sulfate in the seawater completely suppresses uh, the generation of methane. So there are several techniques in which we can also mitigate these increased methane emissions, but also without mitigation, uh, it is better to have this methane than the continuous uh, emission of this bad CO2. 
Yes, I think that's very important to know that there are possibilities to mitigate at least part of the methane emissions. Yeah. I have a further question from Mary who asks, in a changing climate where warmer year round temperatures will favor decomposition and longer and more frequent drought will cause severe drying events. How do we ensure peatlands stay wet enough to function well? And that was something I encountered myself when I was visiting a, um, a High more, I don't know, um, in, in the Black Forest, um, which is fueled, so to speak, by rainwater and with decreasing summer rains, the, the, pe the peatland deteriorates. So are there, how can we preserve peatlands when there is not enough um, precipitation? Now, we will not be able to preserve all peatlands on the places where they are now. Of course, climate change leads to a movement of, 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 of precipitation, etc., etc., and to uh, locally more evapotranspiration. Two things are important to recognize. Peatlands have experienced already a lot in the last 10,000 years. Uh, they were already there under hotter periods. They have self-regulation mechanisms to cope with that uh, as long as they are living. After you have drained them, it becomes more uh, difficult. So it is beneficial also uh, for the resilience of the peatlands to rewet them. Uh, so that is important. From a climate change point of view, it is important to keep in mind that there is this linear relationship between water level and emissions. So even if you cannot rewet to the top uh, under drier uh, climates, if you only rewet uh, to half of the former water level, you have reduced your emissions already with half. Uh, so it is always beneficial uh, to do these things. And last but not least, we should also not forget that the warmer temperatures and the higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere on the places where there is water availability also lead to a faster sequestration of CO2. Uh, peatlands are now growing faster uh, uh, compared to the past because of CO2 fertilization. That is also mm -hmm. an effect. So it, it compensates a little bit. Eh? The most important factor is human activity. It is the drainage. That is uh, up till now, and I, it will continue for tens of years, and the human activities are much more important uh, than the climate change. Thank you, Professor Justin. And um, I'm a very bad housekeeper because we're so much behind time. So I will not read out further questions, but pass on to Sabine. And maybe we can come to the questions at the end of the event. But that was really very insightful. Thank you so much. Um. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm happy to introduce you to Paludi culture today. Uh, so we have heard about restoring and retting peatlands, but we also have to think about the people and to maintaining provisioning services of peatlands and paludiculture is here the solution. Paludiculture means uh, productive use of wet and retted peatlands. So it combines the uh, agricultural and silvicultural utilization with uh, maintaining the peat body. So stopping subsidence and soil degradation and reducing greenhouse gas emission. Optional target may be uh, the provision of other ecosystem services like water retention, nutrient retention, or the enhancement of biodiversity. Uh, for polluted culture, we do need, of course, species which are adapted to wet conditions. So box species or fence species we should distinguish. Uh, but next to the well known wetland species there are much more uh, in the world and a colleague of mine, uh, Susanne Abe, she compiled a database of potential paludicultural plants. So plants adapted to wet conditions, which uh, can produce useful biomass and sufficient quantity and quality and which enable the conservation of the peat soil. And in this database we have over a thousand entries already now globally and about one third of it is promising or has a good potential for paludiculture. Next to adapted species, we also need harvesting machines adapted to wet conditions. So mainly to the low, having a low ground pressure uh, because we have very soft soil, but also adapted to the different types of biomass which should be harvested. But there are technical solutions already available which can be further optimized. And we do need utilization options which are adapted to the biomass properties. 
So it's about refining traditional biomass uses and developing innovative utilization options. And here, the development of bio-based economy helps us with developing new value chains, actually, to enable the transition from drainage-based to wetland or peatland use. Coming now to some examples. So you all know wet meadows, which are dominated by sedges or wheat canary grass, or uh, having heterogeneous vegetation stands. And one uh, promising option is to produce fibers from this biomass, which can be used for biodegradable dishes or paper or panels, as you can see it here on the uh, picture in the right corner. Traditional uses uh, encompass, of course, um, biomass used as bedding material or for fodder with a low feeding value, for instance, for horses, and also the energetic uh, utilization, so combustion or biogas generation is an option. For instance, in Germany, we have an example in the northeast. Uh, there's a heating plant which is fed with biomass from about 400 hectares of fence. And uh, this um, heating plant is providing heat to over 500 households, a kindergarten and a school. And we have uh, emission reductions in two ways. First, from the wetting of the peatland, so that's about 10 tons CO2 equivalents per hectare and year. And in addition, also the substitution of uh, fossil, fossil fuels with about uh, three tons per hectare and year. You also may gra um, graze wet grasslands with adapted species like, for instance, water bu buffaloes, as you can see here. Uh, one important and well-known and traditionally used wetland plant is reed, so Phragmatis australis. It is used for setching, for construction, as insulation um, material, for paper production, or also for energetic use. And this is maybe the most well-known utilization option read as traditional roofing material across Europe. But what is less known is that the major reed consuming countries as the Netherlands, Germany, UK and Denmark, they rely on imports. Uh, they can cover only 20% um, of their reed demand by, by reed fr from their own country. So the reed is coming from other European countries uh, like Romania or also from the Ukraine, Turkey, and even as far as from China, despite of being traditionally locally available. Cattail is another promising plant. It has a spongy tissue, which has a very good insulation properties and at the same time supporting tissues, which makes the biomass suitable for producing load bearing components as well. So there are several marketable and promising products developed. There's a high demand from the construction sector, sector but uh, no products are produced currently because there's no farmer cultivating cattail. To show these possibilities, we built a tiny house in, in Greifswald this year, which is made from paludi biomass. We want to show the high value of such construction material uh, of renewable biomass, which is produced with a low energy consumption and is also suitable for cascade utilization. And here in the tiny house, we use, for instance, cattail for construction boards, reed for insulation panels, alder for the wall covering inside, and red grassland biomass for constructing furniture. Another very important um, option is to grow sphagnum um, on um, box. So sphagnum biomass is a high quality growing media constituent for professional agriculture. And just to illustrate how it can look like, here is the initial state of the former buck grassland. You need a quite, quite a lot of investment um, and effort for preparing the site, but already after half a year, you have established such a sphagnum lawn uh, and a permanent culture, which can be harvested several times. And these biomass uh, can be uh, used to provide um, dial spores for new sphagnum farms or for restoration, and also for orchid cultivation, since sphagnum is traded globally uh, uh, for, for, orchid, for the orchid sector. Uh, and it's also competitive in quality with peat, which is the uh, uh, most important constituent for horticultural substrates. 
but it is not competitive in price. That's mainly due to the low price of fossil peat not uh, taking into account the external costs of peat extraction. But if the end consumer uh, would, would pay a top up of 10% for the sustainable end product, uh, already today we could um, cover the costs of sphagnum farming um, and compete with peat. In addition, we have the climate benefits so from rewetting and from peat replacement. So it's about 30 tons of CO2 per hectare and year, which can be mitigated. This is examples we see that paludi culture provides multiple climate benefits. So it's climate smart agriculture. It provides renewables for replacing fossil resources. Uh, we have the carbon capture and long-term storage and long-lived products, for instance, in the building sector, but why is there a little large-scale implementation? That's mainly because paludic culture means a paradigm shift in peatland use. We really have to change uh, our management. We have to raise the water level instead of drainage. We need new crops and machines which are adapted to the high water levels. We need to develop innovative utilization options and develop new markets. And most important, we need to support wet livelihoods. And therefore, we need to align the agricultural policy to the climate goals. The current CAP reform is really a window of opportunity. And actually, the decisions and proposals on the European level are not that bad for peatlands, because in the first time with the new conditionality, um, all agreed on a new a minimum standard for the protection of peatlands and wetlands. And in the pillar two, we have a pro the proposal to include paludi cultures to be illegible for agriculture payments. It's also something new and really a game changer uh, for um, wet peatland use. And we have the new eco schemes, which can be used for peatland um, revetting and support of paludi culture. Now it's really the responsibility of the member states to design their national strategic plans. The pillar two allows um, to provide plenty of possibilities for tailor-made solutions. We can support hydrological studies, uh, the investment in adapted machines, adapted crops. We can support advice and cooperation in peatland management. We can set up new environmental climate schemes supporting peatlands rewetting and uh, high water levels. So uh, there are plenty of possibilities and we are obliged to increase ambition uh, with regard to environment and climate related objectives. So we have to set the course today to make future peatland utilization sustainable. The Green Deal requires a paradigm shift in peatland utilization and, and we will have no paradigm shift without an ambitious CAP and support for a just transition of peatland rich countries. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sabine. This was very impressive and showing very well that um, the restoration of peatland rewetting does not mean that humans have to stay out and that we cannot use this land sustainably. Um, there, you already answered with the question which was um, posed by Katrin asking whether paludi culture would be eligible for funding in the CAP. Um, the negotiations are still ongoing and I know there has been quite a bit of, um, well, no one was really happy when I looked to the environmental groups and um, the NGOs and the Greens and I may I may think that DG Envy was not so happy either after the, the positions of the parliament and of the council were published, but we are still hoping that within the trilogues there might be some remedy being done, especially when it comes to the conservation status, because right now the proposal says, well, we should preserve the status quo, which is of course um, not, not nearly enough because status quo is deteriorating peatlands and we must on in my opinion we must do the opposite we must say everything that's deteriorating to peatland must not be eligible for, for funding anymore but um you said that the surcharge of 10 percent i think if people were aware if this for example there was a package in the in the garden market saying 
this does not destroy peatland and this surcharge is needed in order to be able to cover the, the gap in, in the price. I think the consumer, the, the private consumer would probably um, be willing to pay this because you don't buy, I don't know, a ton of this per year, but it might be more difficult when it comes to horticulture. What are your experiences there? Do you know anything about this? Yes, I was actually talking about horticulture products, so not about the, the soil, let's say, so the growing media, but the, the pot of herb, uh, which is uh, bought by the end consumer or the Francesia now for for Christmas. Um, so if the if the end consumer is willing to pay here a, a small top up, it's, uh, it's, it's already enough to uh, use sphagnum biomass in growing these products instead of peat. Mm -hmm. But uh, providing sphagnum biomass for for the uh, hobby market, let's say, uh, for the soil we could buy uh, your, ourselves for our garden. It's much to value, uh, to, to uh, it has a uh, uh, too high value actually. So mm -hmm. there we can mm -hmm. think about other products. We can also use compost made from reed canary grass, for instance, and so on. But growing sphagnum is really for the professional horticulture. Okay, okay. I was just thinking of my my little flower pot on the windowsill where I have um, drosera and uh, this sort of plants, which are really dependent on on having sphagnum or peat as a as a um, as a substrate because you will not be able to grow them on on normal soil. Um, but having learned so much about paludic culture, I will now happily pass on to our Irish colleague Kate um, with her. Well, I could say hands of the ground on the ground experience from peatland restoration in Ireland. Kate, I don't see you. Are there? Are you there? Um, yeah. I'm there. Great. Start sharing. Um, can you see that now? You might try to to go to full screen yeah. from beginning or from okay. Current. Yeah, that's great. Great. Um, so thank you very much Jutta, for the opportunity to talk about, uh, I suppose, what's happening at the grassroots level in Ireland and um, local communities getting involved in bog restoration. Um, so I, I started with this slide, I think, um, from the other speakers. We, we all know um, our environment is in trouble and it's uh, reflected in Ireland uh, as well as Europe. Uh, this is a headline from yesterday from the, the UN chief, humans waging suicidal war on nature. So I'm not going to spend too long on that uh, because this is uh, more of a good news story. And um, it's about a national network called the Community Wetlands Forum. And also one of its members, the Abbey Leaks Bog Project, who is uh, working on um, a restoration project at the moment and for the last I suppose 20 years in the time when, as Carla said, 85% of peatlands have been lost in Ireland. Um, there's also been some really good work happening. So this is a map of some of the members. Uh, there, there are many more have joined since that. And uh, I suppose the main, I'm just going to change that. There we go. Um, the, the main objective of the Wetlands Forum is to provide a platform for community-led conservation groups uh, on the, and based on the principles of community development. And that is empowerment, participation, inclusion and partnership working. And I think, you know, there is a world of philosophy and thinking behind those concepts, but I'm not going to expand on that now, only to say that these values really inform the work of the forum. And uh, our vision, I suppose, we have a vision of a society where wetlands are and peatlands are valued by local communities and where community engagement is valued as a means of protecting and managing wetlands for present and future generations. And you can find out more on our website and uh, our strategic plan is up there as well, which is due for renewal next year. So I, I suppose really, you know, the strength of the forum is the people and how it has facilitated over the 
past five years since uh, it's been in existence, people getting together, uh, site visits to peatlands, meeting like-minded people, um, getting advice on governance, funding, engaging with state agencies, and really bringing together a, a, a kind of a diverse group of people from ecologists and hydrologists to volunteers to NGOs and education providers and uh, a lot of um, shared learning and, and that learning is a two way process so um, it's very much not uh, experts uh, educating communities it's very much uh, people on the ground who, who know their local places as well. So. Um, the Abbey Leaks Bog project, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, their um, group today and the, in the photo on the left, um, you can see the, the community group who originally formed and the plan for Abbey Leaks was to drain the bog and use it for industrial peat production, but uh, there was strong local community op opposition to that and the photo in the left shows the group on a, early on a Monday morning um, standing in front of the machine so that they, they couldn't get in to, to drain the bog. And over the course of the next few years, then the local community negotiated with Board Namona a, a 50 year lease agreement and Board Namona um, handed the bog over to the community to manage for, for those 50 years. So um, they work in collaboration with the technical advisory group and really have gone from strength to strength over the past uh, 20 years uh, since, since it formed. So the restoration project that um, just recently we they've had the results of that and it was a very much a, a collaboration between peatland scientists, the, the community group, state agency, semi-state body, board Nimona, and uh, funding as well. And really, I suppose the, the results speak for themselves. An increase in active raised bog and uh, emissions from the, the bog have fallen. And I suppose, you know, it may be a small uh, uh, outcome when you look at the kind of figures that Hans uh, has, has shown us, but I think it does show that people on the ground can make a difference. And I, th I think we all need to kind of believe that and, and know that in the light of the, the huge challenges that uh, we face. So this just represents the ecotope maps and the one on the left hand side is the 2009 ecotope map and on the right you have the 2020 map. And you can see how the areas of subcentral in the blue have really expanded um, and even a small uh, sections of central ecotope really healthy active raised bog uh, in the middle as well. So the other side of the story, I suppose we've, we've talked about provisioning and regulating services and uh, my work is very much on cultural services and the social values and benefits of bogs. And um, along with the ecological restoration, you have all these benefits and, um, you know, the, for the local community. Um, so many different types of, of people have gotten involved with the project over the years. Um, volunteers built the bog bridge children, artists, they have yoga on the bog, and they have uh, rhododendron clearance uh, volunteer days. And one of the projects that they did was up in the top right corner, the, this rhodo char, which is basically charcoal made from rhododendron, which was cleared from the site and um, used then by artists to um, create. So just really creative responses and lots of citizen science and, and research as well. And I think um, some of you are, I'm sure, familiar with these um, principles from the Society of Ecological Restoration. And on the left hand side, you have your ecological outcomes. And um, I really like the social benefits wheel, which shows, um, you know, the, the social benefits of restoration. And they include community well-being stakeholder engagement, all these things that have happened uh, on the ground with Abbey Leaks Bog, restoring the bog and contributing to, to the economy. 
And just recently, research from the Netherlands um, has talked about how that kind of change in governance from top down to more community based, multi stakeholder approaches involving all these different actors and sectors can increase the supply of all these uh, ecosystem services. So um, I have to, of course, mention all the other uh, members of the Community Wetlands Forum. Um, I, I couldn't even fit everybody on the screen here. Um, the Girly Bog Metal is the group I myself work with and uh, or volunteer with. And there's just such a diversity of projects and activities happening on the ground and communities really getting things done, um, whether it's photography books, um, art projects with children, you can see just there on the center left is a biodiversity Jenga, which I think is just a, a lovely idea. All the kids um, uh, take a, a plant or an animal from the bog. And of course, as with Jenga, you know, the more you pull out, the more, um, the less resilient the ecosystem is. And eventually it could collapse if, if we don't look after it. And um, there's just, I suppose, it's very inspiring to be part of that um, local level activity when, you know, globally there is so much happening that we we, we don't have control over. So, um, yeah, just a big shout out to all the other members of the Community Wetlands Forum. And uh, I just I'm going to finish off with um, a quote from our development officer, Chris Hughes. Um, who is leaving us at the end of this year and has been really great in terms of leadership for um, the forum. And collaboration is the solution. Communities are ready. They just need the right support structures and advice and to be seen as equal partners and joint decision makers. And I, I think really, you know, we, we forget about the, the, the strength and, and the communities can act much quicker um, in many ways than um, state agencies. And there was a, a editorial in the Times recently um, which talked about in a, in a fast world, we have slow governance, um, but communities can act quickly, but we do need the right support and also to be seen as equal partners. And finally, um, we have to escape the life of commodity and replace it with the life of community. What's going to be required is a conversion of consciousness. I call it plant consciousness. So I think that Richard Powers wrote that book, The, the Overstory. And I think what um, he is talking about in that sense is when you look at, uh, for example, lichens, how the symbiotic relationships that they have, fungi, the networks of mycelium, uh, mosses and, you know, communities of plants and that would be what I would take from uh, uh, developing a plant consciousness anyway. So um, that's uh, it from me. And I think I can stop sharing. Yes. Thank you very much, Kate. What a great example. And it, it, you practically answered one of the questions which we had received, if effective management is one of the major reasons, how can local communities be enabled to get involved? I think that was a very, very striking lighthouse example on how to do this and also how to have all people on board and have the, the, the whole society supporting it, not only the crazy environmentalists, um, but, um, but those that actually live there. And um, I have a question there. Did you have any difficulties? Um, I, I did not quite grasp who was the owner of, of the areas which were actually restored. Did you buy them off the owners or did they receive a compensation? Yeah, so the, the owner of the Abbey Leagues Bog Project, it was a Bordnamona site and Bordnamona is um, the Ar Irish turf board. So they're oh, the, okay. I they're see. the uh, people who have recently got the 108 million to enable that just transi transition in the Midlands. So Bordnamona, um, because of the community opposition, Bordnamona agreed to lease the bog for 50 years to the community. and. 
I think that kind of um, community land ownership is happening a lot in Scotland now. And it's a, I think it's a model we could learn from um, because it really empowered um, the Abbey Leaks Bog project and, and that community to, to do what they did. And it is a, a, an undesignated site. So, it, you know, it's quite, it's a proposed natural heritage area, but, you know, I suppose that the talk of the Habitats Directive and undesignated, it is, you know, we, we are seeing priority EU habitat develop there. So, um, you know, it's it's a very inspiring story, I think. And um, if, if we had uh, lots of those little networks, um, I think it could make a, a difference, um, which is, I think, something we all need to be feel a little bit hopeful in these times. Mm, mm. Um, would polluty culture be possible on industrial box in or deteriorated industrial box in in Ireland? That was also a question from a participant. I think Board and Mona have looked into a few different kind of um, crops like um, growing birch trees for birch water and herbs. So I don't know what state that's at at the moment, but I know there is a, a project just started in Trinity in Dublin, which is going to be look, looking at the chemical and, um, you know, kind of properties of bog plants. And I think Hans has done or has students doing some work on sundew as well and its medicinal properties. So um, that's a, a possibly exciting. But I don't think to my knowledge, we, you know, we have looked at the kind of polluted culture that Sabine showed there, which is really exciting to see that little um house you know and um <laughs> i like that too <laughs> yeah yeah it's just an example of of trying to get our heads around how this paradigm shift is is going to happen yes i would like very very briefly to give the floor to my colleague luke from the european parliament who is also from ireland um i'm giving him permission to speak so he Luke, your mic should be open, but please keep it short because um, we would like to have a discussion. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jutta. Uh, this has been, I have attended uh, quite a few of these seminars and I have to say, this is the best one by a long, long, long way. I have to say it has, from listening to Professor Hans on the science behind it, listening to Kate Flood, who really knows what she's talking about because she deals with communities, and listening to you all, it has, and Humberto and the rest of you, and Humberto visited Ireland and we had a great discussion on these things. So I just want to say it is, it, it's been very educational. There's one thing that stuck out and the question was asked, why don't we ban peat extraction? Um, I, where I live, every road out of my town, there is peat extraction. Um, I was raised on the finances from bringing turf home. Uh, but I'm also a vegetarian and I'm a vegetarian by choice and my kids are vegetarian and I have one vegan child. And I've often thought to myself, why isn't meat banned? And why don't we ban the production of dairy products? And maybe it would be desirable, but uh, I think the reason is that we've got to convince people to bring them along and that banning anything actually in many cases a bit like the apple in the Bible, never was it so attractive when you banned it. I mean, apples are nice, but they're not worth destroying the world over. But if you ban them, it becomes attractive. So I think the one thing that everyone has to take out of this is we've got to bring people with us. And uh, I am a massive sinner. I am still a turf cutter and I still cut turf. And the only reason that I still cut turf is because I actually got elected on the basis that I represent some of these people and to stop won't stop turf cutting. For me to stop cutting turf won't stop cut turf cutting. But for me, ideally to lead people out of the bogs, I have to do it with them at the same time. And uh, this idea of polluted culture, I see opportunities in it, but at a practical level, uh, like, how likely is this going to happen in Ireland? And at a practical level, we've got to provide people with what we get out of the bog is, and I know all the downsides of it, the two main things people get out of it is independence. In other words, 
no matter how poor I was when I grew up. We Look, sorry to hear. have to have to sorry, cut you I short, but we have only seven minutes, and I would really yeah, like I will to hear the other thirty seconds, Yosha. <laughs> uh, yeah, what I'm saying is, in order to get people to change, there must be a real just transition, and for there to be a just transition, the people who cut turf currently and heat their house with turf currently, they're not doing it to be bad or to destroy the planet. They're just doing it for practical reasons. We need to create a paradigm shift whereby it is even more beneficial that they yes. stop cutting. Look, that's first. what we were all talking about. I will just yes. cut you off because I want to one would like to give the, the panelists the opportunity to discuss. And I think that Professor Houston has given us so much insight on what um, has been happening worldwide actually. And I think we could maybe um, maybe hear what what are your experiences, Professor Yosten? How were was restoration done in Indonesia? So um, from what I gathered, the government more or less paid for it, or was it the people on the ground that engaged by themselves because they had the experience of the fires, which um, destroyed probably also some of their um, some of their villages and cost lives well it was of course uh, trying to cause a mind change uh, making people aware that the burning of uh, 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 biomass uh, for cleaning the fields is a wrong way because then the fire escapes and, and, and goes wild uh, <clears throat> that is important that uh, the attitude has changed but of course there has been a lot of investments of the state itself in in rewetting of uh, state property uh, of course also funded by funders uh, from 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 the west to some extent it is a uh, development is a developed uh, developing country uh, but also on the basis of own uh, things importantly it is also that they simply have prescribed things for example, they have prescribed all plantations on peat, uh, including oil palm plantations and pulp wood plantations, to reduce the level of drainage from generally 80 to 1 meter to 40 centimeters below the surface. In this way, they reduced the emissions by half uh, and they uh, uh, stopped uh, the incidence of fire substantially, but they still enabled. Uh, the same production to continue. Oil palm can grow very well uh, with 40 centimeters, but they have said, okay, now this production cycle, you still can continue because it would be a destruction of capital if you would now rewet and, and, and the palm oil plantations would die off. But if this cycle is, is over, that is after 25 or 30 years, uh, you have to rewet up to the surface and you have to invest in, in, in plants and in crops that can grow with high uh, with high water levels. And that is, of course, also a, a model that you could use in the Euro European Union. Of course, you cannot simply say, okay, uh, uh, we, we, we go all the, uh, we throw all these diary farms from these drained peatlands immediately. But there will be breaking points in which where new investments have to to be done and the areas are anyhow going down all the time eh, etc so you must make a strategy how to get out of uh, the peat had to get out of the peat that is the yeah. strategy and the same is actually also what we were talking about use of peat why is it not forbidden because we all every day eat peat and peat is so important in commercial horticultural production that all the vegetables that we eat uh, all the plants that we buy in one part of the life cycle have been produced on peat. Uh, we eat the stuff every day. And if you forbid it in Ireland, they get it from the Balticum. And if you forbid it in the Balticum, uh, they will get it from Belarus. It, there is a demand for it. And the, the demand is driven by our consumption that we want to have fresh vegetables every day of the year uh, in unlimited uh, 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 amounts. Uh, and we can only... Uh, forbid these things when we provide alternatives, mm -hmm. alternative substrates, eh? and we do not have them yet, and the alternatives are not sufficiently yet available, eh? or that we change vegetable production to a completely different si system, for example, hydroponics. Uh, these are the, the, the solutions, but we cannot simply, eh? I, I always say, who is without peat throws the first brick. Eh? <laughs> we, we all eat peat. That is the problem. 
Yes, but I think there, well, that would be a, a discussion going into the horticultural sector where I'm not really firm on my feet, so to speak. So um, I will rather leave that off. But there have been a few questions, um, especially to um, Umberto, when it comes to funding and um, conservation, um, because right now we don't apply the pollute to pays principle to um, to peatlands that are being deteriorated by agricultural use. On the contrary, um, people have to sometimes provide private funding for the restoration of peatland. How could we have a paradigm shift there? Because if we had the polluter pays principle, then we could fill the gap, the funding gaps very easily, probably. Also, some people said, shouldn't DG Envy be more involved in shaping the common agricultural policy? Because right now it doesn't look like the goals of the Green Deal can be actually fulfilled. Thank you. Well, I first concur that this was a rather uh, interesting event and I've learned a lot on listening to it. Uh, so my quick comments. First point is there will not be a magical one solution, one solution, be it uh, forbidding everything, banning this and that, or just applying a principle as if that would solve everything. Yes, the space principle is a very important principle, and we have still some contradictions. We have seen, for instance, how we are still subsidizing uh, peat destruction through indirect practices, including agricultural ones. So what I take from here is, it's very clear now the irrationality, including from an economic angle of many things we have been doing for decades, if not for centuries. The difference now is uh, we have more knowledge and we have also more perception of it. The, why? Well, because nature is sending us its invoices. It has buffered us against the impacts of what we do for long but since the 50s and especially the 90s, now we see things hitting us, extreme weather events uh, uh, and, uh, and many other things, including on nature degradation. So I think people, this trend for people to feel something is wrong, we need to reshape the way we deal with the world is there. Now, is this enough to change things? No, it's not, because we are dependent on certain practices, habitudes, and certain flows, like the example of what we eat every day, that we cannot just suddenly change it. That's where I find the, the, the Green Deal on bringing in this just transition is exactly well conceived. We've, we've, uh, we've listened to the example of Luke Flanagan. It made a lot, makes a lot of the difference to go there, speak with people. I, I was in Ireland with him. It's impossible to just expect suddenly you, you stop what you are doing for, uh, for, for decades, no. But then when we see these, these transitions coming, like workers that we used to extract peat now being peat restorers and money coming in for that, that's the way to go when we must go everywhere. So finally, also the win-wins that we can get from new uses of wetlands. And I, I'm a, a true believer of paludiculture and its potential. Again, it will take time, but we can get there. Finally, on the cap uh, and, the, and more involved. We are very involved, I ensure you that. We are inherently in the commission. We are all involved by the process itself. So the commission has said, actually in the staff working document, that the cap proposal can be compatible with the Green Deal, provided the ambition level is maintained or even increased. Now, are we reassured on the proposals we have from the, in the table from the co-legislators? No, we are not. We have listened to Vice President Timmermans telling it. But there's a negotiation process ongoing, and we certainly need the, the Parliament, the Council, and indeed all society to pay attention to the issue of the common agriculture policy because its effects go much beyond agriculture only. Yes, that's that's perfectly true. Um, there was uh, quite a bit excitement about polluted culture now. What do you think? Is there is polluted culture use? Um, does it jeopardize restoration, or is polluted culture 
let's say, beneficial enough so that it, um, doing a complete restoration, not using the, the land anymore would be a lot of added value. I think you have a lot of experience there, Sabine, and um, the University of Greifswald certainly has done studies, right? Yes, I think we, we should distinguish here as well. So the first point is to to keep living peatlands, living mires wet, then to, to restore degraded peatlands. And if you want or need to use it, and it's mainly about the now agricultural use drain peatlands and the peatland rich region, their paludic culture is an option. But uh, it's not about conducting paludic culture on all peatlands, but it's providing an alternative to the people living from the peatlands now and uh, maintaining the provisioning services. So that's about the just transition in peatland rich um, regions because, because without the people, we won't, uh, we won't conduct a large scale restoration of peatlands. We won't manage. Mm. People are depending with their livelihoods on this land and we need to provide alternatives and we can't leave the responsible to the single farmer because it was the society who asked for draining peatlands and for reclaiming peatlands for food production. And it's now also the task of all of us to make the paradigm shift and to support people with this transition. Yes, and I think it, it also depends on, on the situation. Um, when, when we went on vacation in summer to Schleswig-Holstein, where you have, where it's comparatively easy to, to restore um, or at least stop the deterioration because you actually have to use pumps in order to keep the land um, drier. Um, and it's much more difficult to restore a, a hill bog or something which is, um, which is fueled by rainwater and where the drain, drains go deeper every year by themselves. And secondly, I'm not sure whether it would be easy to apply polluted culture to, let's say, all areas in Niedersachsen where there used to be bogs, because that would be several thousand hectares um, just in, in one county, I, I believe. So um, what are your experiences there? How, how large could those projects be rolled out in, within a short time frame? Well, the, the, the long-term target is very clear. We have to revet all terrain peatlands and also all peatlands in, in Lower Saxony, <laughs> but of course- no, I mean, using polluted culture on those areas. Rewetting is one thing, but doing polluted culture is something on top, right? Yeah, it, it depends really. There are many farmers living in Lower Saxony which completely depend on, on peatlands. They only have their farm located on peatlands and they do need alternatives. Mm. And mm. Um, we, we need now to, to, to show with the new CAP that uh, peatlands matter, that uh, climate matters, but we don't need to set the, the minimum standard, uh, the condition too high because it's also uh, the, the measure of uh, what is, um, can be supported with, for instance, agro-environmental schemes. Mm. So if the, if the minimum standard is too high, you can't support the farmers in the transition. So that we, we have also to consider, yeah. Hans, you would like to um, um, Maybe I can react a little bit. Uh, of course, on a European Union level, we talk about 3% of the agricultural uh, soil. And of course you could get that completely out of production and in this way reduce your emission from agriculture with 25%. That would have, on, on paper, that would not be a problem. Have you could, <laughs> Uh, 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 regain this missing production on the remaining 97%. And the point is, of course, there are large areas in Europe uh, where peatlands are so dominant that you would change the complete attitude, the uh, complete uh, uh, situation of, of, of the area. Uh, entire areas only consist of peat, and you can, of course, make them into wildernesses again uh, and, and, and change farmers into tourist uh, managers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think for the time being, we have to think about that agriculture should be replaced by agriculture, only drain-based by wet-based. Well, I still believe, and I think Carlos might nod his head now. Sorry that uh, you were you were not really um, addressed in the questions because I mean the EEA is producing such valuable reports, and um, I keep reading them, or I try to read them because they produce 
rather a lot of them. And um, it's really, really good input for my work in European Parliament. I would actually say that we need a certain share at least um, where we do rewilding, where we do not use the, the area anymore, but where we let nature develop itself. Of course, we're wetting, no question on that, but then leave it alone, look what happens. I think the um, situation in the ODA Delta was um, quite good. What happened there where wetland developed by itself, more or less, due to an accident because a dike broke. And, um, oh God, we're running out of time. So I am cutting this very short here. We have written a few demands, which we will, of course, develop further following this discussion, following other discussions, and which can be found on my homepage shortly, and maybe also on the Greens EFA homepage when the group has agreed on them. But now it is really high time to thank my distinguished speakers. It, it was such a great webinar and I find it so great that you made this possible, um, that you could give us those two hours with such valuable input for a lot of people. And I'm sure many will watch the webinar um, after this event because the, the 10, 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning is not possible for everyone interested in this important topic. So thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you, Professor Houston. Thank you, Sabine. And thank you, Kate. It was such a great event. And if there is anything you would like to um, talk through with me, please do not, um, do not wait. Just send me an email and we'll make it possible as as soon as, as it is feasible, and I will depend on your input also for my input to the Nature Restoration Plan. Thank you to all participants that have been listening now, and I'm really happy that so many people are interested in this important topic. Bring back box at the heart of the EU Nature Restoration Plan. Stay safe, stay healthy, and for those whom I'm not seeing anymore, Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.